This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello, everybody, and welcome to CWK Live every Monday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. I am your host, Dan Z. Thrilled to be talking Star Wars with each and every one of you, and we have got a spectacular show tonight. Of course, we are talking about your top five moments from the Book of Boba Fett, Return of the Mandalorian. We've got some Star Wars trivia, and of course, your comments and questions. So let's go ahead and bring in all of our friends here. Let's see. Of course. All right. So who do we have with us? Now we've got Minta, of course. This is the way it's CWK Day. Welcome, Minta. Welcome back to the show. Carter is back. Hello, Carter. Good to see you, my friend. Good to always have you back on CWK Live. And of course, Mason Z is here. Hello, Mason. Alex is here. Hello, Alex. Loving your pictures of you and your son, man. That's really great. Love it. Love it. Love it. Happy Monday to you, Mary. Mary and LJ are no doubt very, very happy today because their their team is going to the Super Bowl. So congratulations to the both of you. I know you've waited for, my gosh, 40 years, 30 years, something like that. Wow. Jason, happy, it's great to be back with you, bud. Good to see you. Hello, Blake. What is up, man? Alex, when you said let's get the show on the road, I have expected you to walk into the studio. Ross says, it's go time, friends. Yes, it is. Hello, Amber. Howdy to you. Jamie is here. Good evening, Jamie. Ian says, very excited to chat about 51 minutes of some of the best Star Wars ever. Well, you know what? I loved it, too. Um, it's pretty spectacular. Definitely spectacular. All right. Liberty is here. Hello, Liberty. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to the show. Andrew says, it was the fastest 51 minutes ever. It was really fast. Ben is here. Hello. Good evening, Daniel. Hello. And Brian is here. Happy CWK Monday, everyone. Yes, we've got some trivia. And Darren is here, too. Wow, look at everybody. This is great. So nice to have you all. Again, we're going to talk about your top five favorite moments from the book of Boba Fett, Return of the Mandalorian. An amazing episode. Let's just jump right into it. We're going to have some Star Wars trivia later. But now let's take a look at what is brewing in the world of Star Wars this week. Okay. Okay. Ben says he's torn on the Super Bowl. Underdog Bengals on one hand, my voice taffer on the other. What do I do? I don't know. You've got two weeks to decide, buddy. Two weeks to figure it all out. Let me try to adjust the lighting again as we do every week, it seems. Oh, that's too dark. Uh, let me move it a little bit this way. Uh, that's a little bit better. That's a little bit better. I'll have to mess with that again. All right, the saga continues. So the main thing I want to talk about this week as far as what's brewing is 25 years ago today. 25 years ago today, Mason is driving the coffee with Kenobi feed, and he says he's rooting for the Bengals, which is awesome, which is awesome. I love that. So 25 years ago today, in movie theaters nationwide, the return of Star Wars to the big screen. The special edition Star Wars New Hope came out 25 years ago. I remember it so beautifully. I remember standing in line all day to get tickets for this movie that I'd seen countless times on VHS, on beta, on HBO, on TV, in movie theaters, in a drive-in movie theater. But seeing it back in the big screen where it hadn't been for a very, 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 very long time was an electric moment. I had the Power of the Force Chewbacca figure in my pocket. And then the news crews came out and I held up my Chewbacca to see if they would oh, look at this group ball holding this Chewbacca action figure. What is this guy doing? I was a senior in college. Yeah, I was a senior in college. And it was the excitement was insane. And I remember, I told this on the show before, but I remember sitting there and uh, going through the line and there was uh, someone working at the concession stand. And she said, oh my gosh, everybody, it's just a movie. And I remember thinking, just a movie? This is Star Wars. Seeing Star Wars on the big screen is a big deal it was electric it was electric the power of seeing that again on the big screen even though we knew everything that was going to happen in the movie seeing it in a theater full of fans 
screaming and cheering and clapping. There's just nothing like it. I hope one day to take Mason to Star Wars A New Hope in movie theaters because it's the best. It is the best. All the Star Wars movies are great for different reasons. Some obviously better than others, but overall the power of A New Hope is unlike anything in a movie theater. It just really is that special. I mean, it started it all. It started it all. Okay. Uh, let's see. So Jason says, go for Stafford. He played for the Lions for a long time. He deserves a championship. I think that's uh, I think that's understandable. Ian says, can you be more of an underdog if you're a long-suffering Detroit Lion? True. 14-year-old Ian was seeing Star Wars New Hope in theaters. I love that. Anthony, this is the way. Glad to make it to CWK live after grad school. Grad class came out. Anthony, welcome back to the show. Alex referring to the con- person working at the concession saying this is just a movie. says she was talking crazy. It was wild, but very special. Hard to believe that we've had a, the special edition of New Hope longer than we've had the actual original Star Wars. In fact, most some of you maybe have never seen it uh, without the special edition. Or you, or you probably have as a bootleg or whatever, or just the old DVDs of them too. Mary says, I took my nephew as a ring bearer in our wedding in 1983 to all the re-releases. He was and still is a huge Star Wars fan. Wow, that's so cool. Anthony got to see New Hope a few years ago with an orchestra and it was phenomenal. I bet it was. I definitely bet it was. So yeah, had to address the special edition. I remember going to see Space Jam, the first one with Michael Jordan, and seeing the trailer for the special edition and not knowing the special edition was going to come out in theaters, not knowing Star Wars was coming back to the big screen. I lost my mind. And then I watched Michael Jordan play basketball with Bugs Bunny. What a day, right? What a day. <laughs> uh, Mason is on the Harry Potter kick. He says, man, I'm moody. Okay. Uh, Ross has attended that on opening night with my close friend Jason, who I've been friends with since the third grade. That's cool. Yeah, we're going to have memories. Star Wars, seeing a movie like that in a, in a theater, you have those special memories. So good. All right, see, speaking of special memories, we made a whole bunch of them when we watched the latest episode of I almost said the Mandalorian of the book of Boba Fett so we're going to talk about it right now your top five moments from the book of Boba Fett episode return of the Mandalorian return Amber has never seen the original stars I'm assuming you mean not the special edition well Amber we got to rectify that my friend it's it's pretty great I mean the special effects are different because it's the original ones no job of the hut no Boba Fett but spectacular just great really special. I showed it to Mason when he was younger. I don't know if you remember that particular version of it, but but it's great. Uh, Yes, that is the one she referred to. Okay, very good. Uh, So top five moments from the book of Bofet, Return of the Mandalorian. I want to address something. I addressed it on the show this week. And, you know, I'm always, I always am happy and proud to to host coffee with Kenobi and to talk about these episodes. But this one, this episode this week that Tom and I did, where we really broke this episode down. I mean, we really broke it down thoroughly. Uh, was great. I really enjoyed talking about it with him. Uh, talking about it out loud or writing about it helps to kind of think about it differently. And there's a, some things that we addressed there that I want to talk about for sure. Ian says, great discussion this week, Dan Tom. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. The big thing, and I'm going to address it very, very, very briefly here, is when people say, I like the episode, but... Why was it called the Book of Boba Fett? Why wasn't this in the Mandalorian? Well, this is the quick Cliff Notes version. I go on about it for about 10 minutes on Coffee with Kenobi. So be sure to check that out if you haven't already. But basically it's this. If this is really the book of Boba Fett, then we're going under the presupposition that it's chapters. Chapters in a book. Not every chapter in a book has the main character, right? Sometimes side characters or, ans- characters or ancillary characters show up because they will propel the story forward more for the main character, and that's going to happen, I assume, in the book of Boba Fett. So that's why it works for me. It's unconventional, and I think that's another reason why I like it. Again, see my conversation about it with Tom this week on Coffee with Kenobi. But let's go ahead and look at our top fives. First, number five for me is the N1 Starfighter and Easter eggs. This episode was packed to the gills. Stuff from Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Clone Wars, Rebels, the original trilogy, the prequel trilogy. I mean, there were so many things in this episode that are love letters to all kinds of versions, all kinds of different parts of Star Wars. And it was spectacular and fantastic. But seeing the M1 Starfighter modified to look like 
well, the Mandalorian basically looked like Beskar, but it's an N1 starfighter with some pre-Empire tech, and it was just so cool seeing BD, all of that. I mean, it's all going to come up, of course, definitely. Uh, characters from the Mandalorian were in there as well. We've got a lot of your top fives. So we're going to jump into yours, but to me, just the, the starfighter and Easter eggs, there was just so much cool stuff there. Loved it. Number five for Alex. Seeing BD, I'm a huge fan of the Fallen Order video game. Yes, that is definitely a BD unit. I don't think it's the same one. They haven't come out and said that, but I just kind of have a hunch based on different things I've seen online from people I trust that it's, it's just a BD unit and adorable. Seeing it in live action was great, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. Daniel, the whole episode is a top five. It is. This was very hard to kind of narrow it down, wasn't it? Very hard to narrow it down. Brian's number five. The mysterious reveal of Din Djarin at the beginning of the episode, the music had the hairs in my arms stand on end, even though I'd heard that music over a hundred times. Brian, it was very special. I, I have a feeling it's going to come up pretty soon from me. For sure. Uh, Mason has said he's on Harry Potter or the Phoenix number five. It's true. It's true. You are. And I have Mason's number five uh, here. I'll just say, share Mason's number five now. Uh, seeing the Trail of a Thousand Tears and seeing the great purge um and the the power of that how we've heard about that in the mandalorian and how heavy that is in the world of star wars and what happened to mandalore itself and just seeing that albeit briefly was very powerful that was mason's number five May Minta's number five i can bring you in warm or i can bring you in cold nice call back to the first episode of the mandalorian wasn't that awesome so good ian's number five bryce dallas howard she knocked it out of the park who can forget that incredible single take elevator to elevator shot? Nice. Good good job. Good job on you. Ian, I like that. Yeah, it was, it was very, very filmed beautifully. And a lot of people are saying Bryce Dallas Howard needs to actually direct a live uh, a film, a Star Wars film. That would be great. I'm very much on board for that. Mary Pelly, Moto, and Din restoring the ship. Then Mando flying the pod racing course and going up to space. Wizard. Exactly. I see what you did there, Mary. Very clever. That was very awesome. Jason, uh, similarly, Pelly Motor, she was absolutely hilarious. Too much info on the Jawas, though, right? Jawas are hairy, as we have discovered. Pretty gross. Uh, Ross, thank you for traveling Starliner Travel. Din Djarin landing on Tatooine via tr public transport with all of his weaponry and what it amounts to a checked bag. Wasn't that great? So great. Hilarious. A lot of good comedy here. Blake's Seeing the BD unit, who was your joy, your droid in Jedi Fallen Order. Love that game and seeing that droid was super special for me as someone who loves Star Wars gaming. Oh, I bet you were going crazy, man. That was so cool. Liberty, I so enjoyed hearing all the lines we've heard from Mando before. Bring you in warm. Weapons are part of my religion. He said your former employer. He said that in The Mandalorian, but I couldn't remember what context, but it was said in the same tone, and I loved it. Yeah, it was, it was brilliant. Definitely brilliant. James is number five is the same as Minta's. The triumphal return, I can bring you in warm or I can bring you in cold. We're going to hear that a lot, and we should. It's epic. Number five for Ben. Pelimoto's humor, her furry moment, was the best. Bryce Dallas Howard got so much out of every second of her screen time. Definitely. Definitely. A lot of humor in this, for sure, as we mentioned. Darren, yes, in one as a replacement ship was very surprising. I said they gave the reasoning. Mainly the tracking, it can't be, basically. Yep. I think uh, that was cool. Now, I don't know how much room he's going to have in that thing, but we'll worry about that when we get to that point, I guess. Mandalorian seems happy. He definitely can escape, everybody. Daniel's number five, the reveal of a ring world. The surroundings were spot on and gave a real vibe of something different in the Star Wars universe. Right. We've never seen anything quite like that in Star Wars. Daniel, I'm glad you brought that up. That was really cool. That was very cool. Uh, let's see. Amber, creating the M1 Starfighter for Mando with B1. I love B1 using the hologram to show where to place the metal. Love that game. It was very cool. Super cool. I gave Mason's number five, so let's go ahead and jump into number four. Number four for me, the cliffhanger. At the end of the episode, the Mandalorian mentions uh, he's got to go see a little friend. Mason and I stare at each other. We gasp out loud, and, and that's over. And then we just have... Two more sleeps until we get to see the next of the book of Boba Fett. Who knows what we're going to see, but what a cliffhanger. I mean, it starts out with a bang. It ends with a bang. I love that. What could be better? What could be better? So a great, 
a great little way to end the episode and leave us wanting more on an episode that was already spectacular as it was. Number four for Ian. The dynamic between Din and Pele and her droid pals. Every time you see these two on screen together, you know you're in for a fun time. It's true, and it never feels forced or like we've seen it before. It's always fun and fresh. Number four for Minta, the cameo of BD. I haven't played the Fallen Order game, but that little droid stood out to me ASAP and stole my heart. Minta, I think you love that game. It's super cool. We need to finish it. I say that all the time. Uh, Ross, all things in one Starfighter in the second half of the episode. Just a cool way to introduce so many new elements while paying homage to the prequel trilogy. Beggar's Canyon, so fun. I know, and it's the Pod Racer course too, and it's just great. And Womp Rats. Womp Rats. Alex's number four is the Halo Ring-like sp- space station. It was breathtaking. It really was. It really was. Number four for Brian. I know everything that's in there. The unloading of all the weapons while boarding the commercial transport reminds me of the Babylon 5 movie, A Call to Arms. When a thief, Darina, tries to board the station and has to remove all of her 1,001 weapons before being allowed in. Yeah, we. I knew there were some other things that were there for sure. Um, like seeing a, a scene like that. Uh, Mason's number four. Uh, Mason, do you want to change uh, what you have on your list? You can, of course. But Mason just time, chimed in. My number four is actually, I dated a, a Jawa once <laughs> when Billy Moto said that. That's Mason's number four. Unless you want to do the one on the paper, man. You just let me know. Uh, Ben's number four. Mando makes a gift for Grogu. Even the cloth that was tied in looked like Grogu's little head. Din is hooked. He loves that kid. Okay. So when you first see it, you kind of miss it. And when you watch it again the second time, it's definitely there the first time. And then you watch it the second time, as far as the second time in the episode itself, and it's unmistakable that it is in the shape of Grogu. And the armor does give it to him like that as well, which is great. Jason's number four, Mando wielding the Darksaber against the gangsters. I wasn't expecting that at all. Such a great moment. So powerful. So powerful. Uh, we were talked for like forever about that in This Week Coffee with Kenobi. And all the little things we noticed, it was great. Liberty, Peli Moto in general, she's such a great character. Furry, very furry. Yes. Number four for Blake, the fight over the dark saber with the other Mando. That whole sequence was filled with action, but also very important lore. I wrote a lot of notes about that lore. It's really important stuff. Mando's number four. I'm sorry, Mando's number four. Whoops. Mary's number four. Well, you both of you are cool. And both of you start with the letter M, so, you know, it was an honest mistake, Mary. Mary number four is Mando checking his weapons with the Rex droid. He needs TSA pre-check. Yes, highly recommend that, for sure. Come on, Mando, you should ask me. Number four for Jamie, dialogue between droids and Pelimoto, plus all the shop talk between her and Mando, and wow, that Womp Rat was something. It was huge and ferocious. I didn't expect him to be, like, dangerous to people. Next for Amber, the ring thing was so cool, and the training with the armorer. Train with the armorer for sure. Ian says Mando's the best dad in Star Wars. I think so too. I think so too. Mason, your number four on the paper is the new ship. This is what you put for the new ship. Uh, if you want, Mason, you can come in here real quick and grab your paper and I'll give it to you. Uh, number four for Daniel, the Naboo in one fighter reveal, the build and flying of it, which was very epic for sure. Darren's, yes, the ring roll was something totally different. Interesting. My son said, like, Halo, that ring. Yeah, a lot of nods to the other kinds of science fiction, for sure, which I also really enjoyed. Okay, so Mason's going to go with the one he said. Okay, sounds good. All right, let's go to number three. Number three for me is the Mando Mythology lesson. Look, I pause, I turn on the captions the second time I watched it, and I pause it like every... 15 seconds and I wrote down all kinds of stuff that the armor said to Din Djarin about the legacy of the lightsaber the myth of Mandalore what it means to be a Mandalorian uh, uh, the cautionary tale of Bo-Katan all of that stuff it was just so rich and of course I love mythology I mean we all do and it's just there's just a lot to really break down a lot to dissect a lot of things I hope to write about talk about and chat about with all of you on Coffee with Kenobi Hopefully it's celebration this year. There's just it's just great. Whenever you add to the legacy and the mythology of Star Wars in a meaningful way that adds more depth to the story and propels it forward, I am all in. And they did this at an almost unprecedented level. It was just terrific. Okay. Number three for Minta. 
Return of the N1 Starfighter, quite wizard indeed. That is for sure. Number three for Ian Glavis. It was so cool to see a new Star Wars world, especially when that looked so awesome. I know. I know. Alex is number three, the introduction of his customized lightsaber. Starfighter, sorry. The number three is the introduction of his customized Starfighter. That was fantastic and a great surprise. Number three from Amber. All the Mandalorian lore explained was so awesome. Agreed. That was my number three as well. Jason, the ring world, what a cool imaginative setting. I like that we keep seeing more about the ring world. It, was, it would seem more sci-fi than a lot of Star Wars. I mean, it was much more science fiction-y, almost kind of a Blade Runner vibe or other vibes we talked about. But I'm glad that people have enjoyed that one as well. It was neat. Number three for Ross. Every time the lights, the dark saber is ignited. Din Djarin, the armorer, Paz Vizsla, it evokes a different physical reaction from each of them, and you feel the emotional reaction in turn. Yes, you do. And the sound is great. It's just like the one uh, that you can get at Galaxy's Edge to the exact same sound effect. Number three for Jamie. Two words, airport security, right? For sure. Number three for Mary. The scene with the armorer, the Darksaber story, the training with the Darksaber, and the fight for the Saber. Such a great scene. Truly spectacular scene. Number three for Liberty. The N1 Starship reveal. When he goes through Beggar's Canyon, I jumped up off the couch and yelled. Got chills when he said, let's see what she's got and heads up into the atmosphere. That was, that was great. That was great. Again, like a love letter to all of us Star Wars fans, all the cool stuff in here. Brian, the, the walking Mandalorian library that is the armorer. She has a vast array of knowledge and seems to know everything. Even how to wield a lightsaber. She also knew that his mind was not on the fight. Powerful, powerful metaphor here that I hope to explore even more in the future. But yeah, that was very powerful. And I like you said, a walking Mandalorian library. I really like that. Blake's next one. Seeing the space station Mando was on, it looked like it was heavily inspired from the Halo game franchise, which is a nearly identical world you play on. As an Xbox fanboy, I was gushing over its design. Yes, that's that's cool. I like that the video game fan in you is really responding to all this, Blake. Number three for Daniel, the Paz Vizsla Darksaber Challenge and Tussle. I like that too, and I was also frustrated by it. I'm like, there's only three of you. Why are you fighting with each other? There's only three of you left. But it's part of their their culture, their heritage. And I don't know. I wonder how this is going to progress. Interesting. Number three for Ben. Mando goes for a test drive. Of course, Dim would be attracted to a shiny in one starfighter as his next ship, not to mention all the pod racing Easter eggs and the return of the pilot from season two. That's right. Blake's, uh, Mary's says, Blake, exactly what Chaz immediately said. Halo. Yep. The Halo vibe is definitely there. Mason's number three is the Darksaber. Seeing the Darksaber, having it ignited, the, the amazing myriad ways that they use it in the episode, uh, the bisection at the beginning of the episodes, and Mason loved that. Let's go ahead and jump to number two. Number two for me is the Darksaber metaphor. Again, I know it's uh, another shameless plug, but on Coffee with Kenobi this week, I talked for a while about the metaphor of the Darksaber and the fact that it was too heavy for him as far as like him fighting with the blade instead of fighting, have, using it with him instead of fighting against it. It's very, very profound, very dynamic. Uh, and the things that it says, and it is just delicious. I mean, it's that's the best word I can say. It's delicious and Please listen to what I said about it on Coffee with Kenobi this week if you get a chance. I uh, hope to explore it much more down the road. But it is very powerful, very smart. It reminded me a lot of actually Spider-Man 2 with Tobey Maguire. There's some of that there. Some of that there. Okay. Uh, number two for Alex. The fight scene at the beginning of the episode, it was brutal. It was very intense. Much more intense than anything we've seen in the book of Boba Fett to me. Amber, the next one, the flight uh, through Beggar's Canyon, the pod racing course, the interaction with the New Republic. Yeah, that was sweet. That was so cool. Number two for Ross, Mandalore, the Darksaber, the Great Purge, the Night of a Thousand Tears, the Mythosar, the Path of Redemption, how different Mandalorian sects view one another. Sign me up for Mandalorian History 560 next semester, right? And you got a, a nice crash course in it for this episode, Ross, for sure. Minta's number two, the Armorer. For mythology lessons that she gave to training with Din Djarin on using the Darksaber, it shows that she is not someone you want to mess with. That is for sure. She is very powerful and very smart. And her silence or her 
Her quiet demeanor sometimes is, is dangerous too. Or intimidating, probably, I should say. Ian's the N1. What a sweet ride. I loved every second of it, seeing it constructed, and the test flight was wizard indeed. Yeah, wizard has definitely come back into the Star Wars consciousness because of how Din Djarin uses it. Of course, a flashback, uh, a nod to Anakin. Number two for Ben. Have you ever removed your helmet? We knew this moment would come. Moment would come, but to see it happen was still heartbreaking. There were so many threads that were out there that were tied up for us in this episode. I didn't expect it. So getting it like that was really cool. I mean, I really thought in this one, Mandela would show up a little bit at the end or just in the beginning or whatever, but it wouldn't really be story based on him. And the fact that it was, was outstanding. Let's see. Jason's number two, Mando's first appearance of the curtain. We didn't know. We didn't even need to see him to know it was him. Pedro Pascal's body language is masterful. It so is. And he's a genius. He's a great actor. Number two for Liberty, the opening scene. The shadow appearing in the music when he lit the dark saber. That was the first of many times I was on my feet. Isn't that cool? And you can ask Mason. I kept saying, I can't believe he's on. I can't believe he's on. I can't believe we're seeing him. I, I couldn't believe it. It just floored me. Number two for Blake. The whole test flight from Baker's Canyon to being pulled over in space by two X-Wings to the landing with the wizard line. The whole sequence might be a top 10 stars moment of all time for me. Oh, I'm glad. I'm really glad. That was, I'm glad that that had that effect for you, Blake. Number two for Jamie. Roll out of the N1 and all the angles, top down, then bottom up, then coming at you. Thought the cinematography of the entire episode was among the best I've seen on, on any Disney Plus Star Wars episode. I agree. It was great. It was great. We had a, a stellar director that was, was pulling the strings there, and that sure helps a lot, too. Daniel's number two. The Darksaber being revealed in the initial scene. Just wow. I know I was wondering where it fall in the timeline, if this was before he met Rogu or after, but... When he pulls that dark saber out, there's no mistaking what's going on. For sure. Mary's number two, the encounter with the X-Wing patrols, then zipping out of there. Their decision not to report the encounter because they didn't want to do the paperwork. The new pilot was Mark Hamill's body double. So cool. Oh, yeah, that's right. I was trying to place that. Very good. Thanks, Mary, for pointing that out. Uh, ben says, Ross, you sure that isn't one through five right there? Uh-oh. Are you maybe subverting the system, Ross? Or I think you're just putting it all together. Either way, we'll allow it. We'll allow it. Number two for Brian. The reveal, rebuild, and test run of the N1 Starfighter. I wonder how we would get to flip the switch and open the engines up in space, and it was a really cool way for them to explain it. Ross is basically the entire recap I wrote is all that. Well, exactly. Exactly. And then Mason, I had a feeling you're going to do this, Mace. So Wizard is in Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, and Hermione Granger, and Voldemort. He must not be named. Yeah, but no, of course not. Uh, Mason's number two is when he says, I'm going to go see a little friend. Uh, that was very exciting. And my number four is Mason's number two, just us being excited about what's going to happen in two more sleeps. Didn't you say that when you were a kid? We always said that the Mason, he was little, you know, just two more sleeps until summer or two more sleeps until Santa's here, that kind of stuff. Ben says, Harry who? Uh-oh. Mason's going to chase you, Ben. <laughs> All right, let's go to number one. Number one thing that we love about Return of the Mandalorian for me is there can be only one. The intro. Are you kidding me with this? The intro was amazing. The silhouette of someone in Mandalorian armor, the way he's got the best scar spear. You don't know if it's Boba Fett or not. I mean, you're pretty sure it's the Mandalorian, but you're not 100% sure. And seeing him walk out through that partition or whatever you want to call it was mind-blowingly cool and all of his best car silver splendor and the music i have goosebumps now that's why i wore the shirt that's why i wore the shirt because it was just a great intro i it was hard not to put the dark Seder metaphor or the man of mythology lesson at the beginning but without the intro none of it happened so it just set the stage and it was just amazing to me i loved it loved it loved it and again you heard me gush about it this week on coffee with kenobi main test number one the Mando's entrance, like mine, just a silhouette and the music alone gave me chills. Exactly. Exactly. Ian, Din Djarin, of course, I could say so much here, but I'll just simply say this. Din is my favorite Star Wars character in this episode. Just reconfirm for me why I feel that way. You know, Ian, I gathered that from your Facebook post, and I'm glad. And I knew I loved Din Djarin, but I, and I didn't realize how much I loved him. Like, I loved him, but I, I guess I really, like... I don't know. It's just on another level to seeing my reaction to him in this episode. It's just fantastic. 
Ross is number one, the Mandalorian appearing right out of the gate with that shiny Beskar armor. He's walking through the plastic sheets of the meat locker as his theme launches. The Mandalorian storytelling and production quality are so elevated. Exactly. So good. Liberty, number one, something for a foundling, a specific foundling. Realizing that we have a greater chance now seeing our little friend was off the couch again. Liberty, you must have been looking like you're doing exercises because you were celebrating and cheering like we all were. I love it. Love it. Number one for Blake, the fight scene at the beginning, arguably the most violent scene we've seen in Star Wars, and I love every second of it. I agree. I think I said that on the show. I think it might be the most violent. Uh, number one for Mary. The opening scene, I can take you in warm or I can take you in cold. The ensuing fight was so intense, especially the use of the Darksaber, also the combining of the Mandalorian and Boba Fett music. Oh, that's cool. I didn't think about that. Jamie, any and every reference to Grogu by his name or as his little friend, plus the visual of the gift, and hearing him say the word Grogu was also cute too. Uh, Alex uh, says, Mando finding his clan. Uh, Mason is commenting on um harry potter's last name and using the unforgivable curse so we're not going to repeat that one jason's number one mando's confession about removing his helmet such a powerful moment at the end of season two i wonder if his tears were as much for his move, removing his helmet for the first time and all that meant as they were leaving were for leaving Grogu. yeah no i think his tear i think he's really at peace with it jason just that's just my take i think he's at, completely at peace with it and i think that we can see by the way he's very laid back afterwards shows it i mean i'm sure that'll be revisited again naturally but a lot again this is why i think the mandalorian is so fascinating because there's just a lot of richness in this character that is even more than a lot of other star wars characters brian's number one the ignition of the dark saber and the meat cooler we were all screaming like someone scored a touchdown right i know i hear you ben says the intro that i stole his mando finally wields the dark saber and the fight was the epic moment we deserved and now We've seen he doesn't always bring in his bounties warm. Nope, he does not, does he? Amber, the Mandalorian entrance in the fight with the gangsters. I thought the fact that he had the wound was so to emphasize the fact that the Gorge wasn't there to heal him. Or Grogu wasn't there to heal him. Yeah. I'm also surprised we didn't see Rocky in that meat factory. Ooh, wouldn't that be fun? A little Stallone. Ross says, Jamie, I was so pumped with the armor, said the foundling Grogu. Wasn't that cool? It's just hearing different characters say that name is just very powerful. Number one for Daniel, seeing the armor at the end of the walkway, her toolkit, forging, and her lesson about the Darksaber. Tar Vizsla, 1,000 years prior. Annie was a Mando and a Jedi. Owner of this will go with Din. Yeah, we've got some possibilities here, don't we? For sure. Uh, Mason's number one. He put the Mando, very similar to mine and many of yours. Just seeing that introduction was very powerful to a lot of us. We loved it. We loved it, and I know you did too. I'm so glad we got to talk about this episode. I've been dying to talk about it with each of you because it was tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Next week, of course, we're going to look at your top five moments from the book of Boba Fett, Chapter 6 moments. But now, but now, it's time for some Star Wars trivia. So let's go ahead and do that. Star Wars trivia indeed. So you know the rule. For Star Wars trivia... Don't look up the answers. Just do your best. Forget the rest. And we'll see how you did. Okay, so a lot of these are going to... We're trying to focus some of these on some, some of the mythology and lore of the Mandalorian itself. Seem kind of appropriate. So here we go. Let's start with the first one. Let's talk about Cara Dune. Cara Dune, once she helps the Mandalorian at the end of Season 1... She receives a new title. What is Cara Dune's new title at the end of Season 1 leading into all of Season 2 of The Mandalorian? What is Cara Dune's new title? She's given a title at the end of episode of Season 1. Anybody know what Cara Dune's title is? Grief Karga gives it to her, if that helps. Grief Karga gives Cara Dune a new title. What is her new title? Uh, Minta says Sheriff. Anthony says Marshal. Ben says Marshal. Daniel says Marshal. Jason says Marshal of the New Republic. Ross says Marshal. Amber says Marshal. Jamie says Deputy. Mm, no one's quite nailed it yet, by the way. Uh, Minta says Marshal. Alex says Sheriff. Liberty says Marshal. 
Uh, Mary says Marshall. Mason thinks the title is Ben Anderson. Just kidding. He thinks it's Marshall as well. Brian says Marshall. Ian says Magistrate. So it is Marshall. I will say it is Marshall, but Marshall, there's something that goes to that. Marshall what? Any guesses? Or if you want to say, I don't know, Mr. Zare, let me know. Sorry, that would be if you were my student. Um, Dan, I don't know what it is. She is the Marshal of Navarro. The Marshal of Navarro. N-E-V-A-R-R-O. That is, of course, where a lot of the action takes place in season one. Oh, Brian says, scheme with Mason theme. How about prefect? No, Kara is not a prefect, but I like that, Ben. Brian, I'm sure that Mason will too. Okay, let's see. Um, I like, there's a lot of questions here that I was thinking about that I want to throw your way. Okay. What is the name of Morgan Elsbeth's enforcer? What is the name of Morgan Elsbeth's enforcer? Morgan Elsbeth fights Ahsoka Tano in the season two episode of the Mandalorian titled the Jedi. What is the name of Morgan Elsbeth's enforcer? Uh, Brian Mason says, good job. There you go. I knew that he would like that. I knew he'd like that. So what is the name of Morgan L's best enforcer? Again, don't look it up. Just do your best. Just do your best. Use the force. This is the way. All that good stuff. Uh, Minta says, it's Thrawn. Ross says, great question. No idea. Mary says, no idea. Ben knows it. Uh, Amber says, is giving the fancy name for Thrawn. Anthony says, it's Michael Bean. I know that. Uh, Daniel says, Poncho. Mason says, the guy with a gun. Jason says, Corporal Hicks. Oops, sorry, wrong sci-fi franchise. You know, you know, when you read and study my new book, Star Wars Character Encyclopedia, you can have all of these answers. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I didn't remember it either, and I even wrote this section. I had to look, I had to remind myself to look it up again, so don't feel too bad about it. <laughs> so, Captain Lang is the name of Morgan L's best enforcer. L A N G, Captain Lang. Here is a picture of it for those of you watching live. Captain Lang is Morgan L's best enforcer. Not Johnny Ringo, as Anthony says, and not Hudson. Well, that's a pretty good guess. That's pretty fun. All right. Okay. There is a creature. So, Ranzar Malk. Is a, is a crew of criminals that works with the Mandalorian uh, at the end of season one to try to retrieve a prisoner. In fact, the episode is entitled The Prisoner. Um, there is a, one of the aliens. His name is Berg. Berg is very muscular. Uh, he's got quite a temper. What species is Berg? What species is Berg? He is a mercenary. He's got all the strength in the episode of season one, The Prisoner. What kind of what kind of creature is he? What species is he? Any ideas? Uh, Blake says a Deveronian, as does Ross, as does Jason. Any other guesses? Any other guesses? We've got three so far. Uh, Mason says the peeps with the horns. That is true. A Deveronian, Deveronian, Deveronian. Mary says Deveronian. So does Anthony. So does Amber. So does Minta. Daniel says all I can think of is devil. Deveronian is what you're thinking. Uh, Brian says Deveronian like in episode four in the cantina. Alex says a Deveronian. Ben's going with the group on this one. So is Liberty. Mason, I'm assuming you want to say Deveronian too. Because the answer is, let's see if we can figure this out. It is a Deveronian. That is correct. Nice job, everybody. Good job. Hey. Okay, just a couple more. Just a couple more. Uh, I will just keep going with the Mandalorian thing. Uh, let's see. This is a really tricky one. Uh, yeah, I think it is tricky. Um. So Bo-Katan is a Mandalorian heiress. She is a warrior. What is Bo-Katan's last name? What is Bo-Katan's last name? She is said to be a cautionary tale, according to the armor, 
But what is Bo-Katan's last name? An interesting question. Uh, we've got some answers here. Ben says Kreese, as does Ross, as does Amber, as does Jason, as does Mason, as does Mary, as does Ian, Anthony, basically all of you, Ian, Anthony, Brian, Minta. Everyone says this one's easy. Uh, so you're right. It is easy. It is it. It's Bo-Katan Kreese, K-R-Y-Z. Exactly. All right. Here's a bonus one. Uh, let me see. How do I want to word this? Bo-Katan, while we're talking about Bo-Katan, she has a specific style of helmet. What kind of Mandalorian helmet does she have? It's part of a group that she's a part of. What is what is the, the description of her helmet as far as the specific clan or, or group that she's a part of as a Mandalorian? She's not a follower of the way. But she has a specific kind of helmet. It's kind of the name of her group that she's with. Ross says Death Watch. Daniel says Night Owl. Mason says Death Eaters. <laughs> Amber says Death Watch. Uh, Minta says Death Watch. Uh, Alex says Death Watch. So does Anthony. Ian says Night Owl. I'm so tempted to say who? That's my joke when I teach the first Harry Potter. Everyone, I always say, now, who is Hedwig? And they say, an owl. And I say, who? And it takes, like, several times before they finally realize Mr. Zara is being obnoxious. Well, of course I am. Uh, Brian says, it's white. And Amber says, oh, night owl. So the answer is, uh, Ben says a night owl, too. Ross agrees with Daniel. Blake says, I remember how much lore I don't remember outside the original trilogy. I know, right? I hear you, man. Uh, Hedwig says Mason and Liberty says Night Owl. The answer is Night Owl. She's a part of the Night Owls. The Night Owl. Exactly. Okay. Let's do... We'll do one more. We'll do one more. Okay. Uh, we'll keep on the Mandalorian theme just because that's what we're doing. Last time we did um, Star Tours. We did Star Tours last time. I'm going to give you another, another question from the Mandalorian. Okay. Cobb Vanth is a sheriff on Tatooine. What is the name of the town in Tatooine that Cobb Vanth is in charge of? Cobb Vanth is a sheriff of a small town on Tatooine. What is the name of that town? Ian says Mos Pelgo. Amber says Freetown. Ross says Mos Pelgo. Brian says Mos Pelgo. So does Anthony. So does Ben. So does Minta. So does Jason. Uh, ben almost said Mos Pogo, which would also be fun. Hoppy. Mary says Mos Pogo. And Daniel says Mos. Blake says Mos Pelgo. Anybody else? What is the name of the small town on Tatooine that Cobb Vanth is the sheriff of? Uh, Blake says, uh, Mos Pogo, as I said, so does Alex. Mason says, Privet Drive in Hogwarts. Mason, I think you might be watching the wrong show, buddy. <laughs> Liberty says, Mos Pelgo. So the answer is, I'll do a drum roll, even though it's pretty obvious. Cobb Vanth is the Marshal of Mos Pelgo. Wasn't it Freetown in, in Aftermath, but Mos Pelgo in The Mandalorian? Yes, it was. And that might have been a different town, too. I'm not 100% sure. But Ross says it's Freetown the Aftermath books, right? It is, but I was under the impression they were separate. But I'd have to do some digging into that one. Ma Mason also has Moss Pogo. There you go. So do you like that with the um, us doing trivia that's specific to certain parts of Star Wars? I mean, I can just always do the movie stuff, but I think it's kind of fun to spice up a little bit to go around and check things out. Uh, ben says, Mason, you're looking for coffee with Creature. Nice. K-R-E-A-C-H-E-R. Look at that, Ben. Actually, I want to say that again. Uh, ben says, Mason, you're looking for coffee with Creature. <laughs> nice job. Nice job. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into Ask DNZ. Oh man, those videos. I miss Lucasfilm and Rancho Obi-Wan and, and all of you at Celebration. Where I hope that 
hopefully we'll get to make that happen very soon. I like the theme and using that great puck. Well, that's very kind of you. Yeah, the theme is fun. The theme is fun. Maybe we'll do like a Star Wars celebration trivia. Oh, that'll be fun too when we get to that point. That'll be fun. Anthony loves the trivia. Well, great. Well, this is where you can ask me anything about Star Wars, Coffee with Kenobi, uh, things that are that are going on in the world of Star Wars or whatever comes to mind. I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. So just ponder that, if you will. Uh, is there any questions that you have or should we just wrap up the show? We can definitely do either one. I, I really, really, again, enjoyed watching this. I love knowing that uh, we're going to get to see more Mandalorian this week and more Boba Fett. So good. Blake says, this is the most important question on the internet. Did you pre-order Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga? And which character do you want to play as the most? It is a very important question. And believe it or not, I haven't yet. I haven't. But I'm going to. What character do I want to play the most? You know, the Mandalorian. If he's an option, I'd like to play him. Although you probably can't unless he's like an unlockable character. But I would say I like playing Luke, of course, or Vader. What about you, Blake? Alex, now that we have had stars told in both live action and TV, which media do you think stars is best told in? You know, it's great on TV. It's great. But the movies and stars are just, there's something extra special about it that can't be replicated in any medium at all to me, I think. What about you, Alex? Jason, where can we pre-order the Star Wars Lego game? Everywhere. Everywhere you order video games, you can pre-order it for sure. What Star Wars show will be released next? I don't think they've officially said. But, I mean, this year we've got another season of Bad Batch. We've got Kenobi. I believe we've got Cassie and Andor. So I'm not entirely sure, but I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out. Mary also likes the theme trivia. Ross's New Repu High Republic book drops tomorrow, right? That is correct. That is correct. The young adult novel comes out tomorrow. How do I rate book five of Harry Potter? It is my least favorite of all the Harry Potter books, although I love it. It's my least favorite, and I'll tell you why after you finish reading it, Mason. Mason's read, by the way, the first five, which is pretty good. Uh, he's in a DLC pack. Oh, really? Mando's in a downloadable content pack. Oh, that's great. I'm definitely doing that. Blake says, pre-order the deluxe version, you get Mando season one and two characters. Well, maybe that's what Blake's, uh, what Amber's talking about. Okay. Well, that's worth it to me. That's where, Oh, Mason wants to play with the Sith Trooper in Lego. That would be sweet. What is the first thing one should do at Galaxy's Edge? Well, the first thing you should do at Galaxy's Edge is, is uh, several months before you get there, and that is, is go online and reserve a spot at Savvy's Workshop to build a lightsaber. It is the greatest thing at Galaxy's Edge in a world full of greatest things. And then go on and make sure you get a reservation to go to Oga's Cantina and get a Bespin uh, Fizz. They're great. They're so great. Uh, ben, between Lie of the Jedi, Rising Storm, and Fallen Order, what has been your favorite so far? You know, they've all been great for different reasons. Lie of the Jedi really moved me. Rising Storm had as 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 a sucker punch. But Fallen Storm, I think, stuck with me the longest. So that's that's a good question, Ben. What about you? Uh, by the way, Claudia Gray will come back on Coffee with Kenobi later and talk spoilers from Fallen Storm. So look forward to that in the future. Did I go back and watch Rebels episodes after Chapter 5 of Boba? I watched Kanan's teaching Sabine with a certain weapon. I, you know, I didn't. I read some stuff about it, though, and I want to again, so that's that's pretty cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ross says, great job, Mason. I'm glad you're enjoying them. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's read, Mason's read the first four. Did I say first five? I meant the first four. He's on the fifth one now. Yeah, he's, he's done great. Have you seen or heard about my friend's new book, Cosplay History? No, Daniel. Be sure to put something about that in the CWK Cafe. I would love to see all about it. Do you have any other books that you're working on? Well, Liberty... Um, I'm not allowed to say that kind of stuff. I wish I could tell you about it, but there's, um, always in motion. The future is Liberty always in motion. The future is how about that? Um, Ben, I'll let you know when I finish Fallen Star by love rising storm. Cool. Yeah. Rising storm is great. It's really great. You know what else is great? You know what else is great? Chatting with each and every one of you every Monday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. It is always a blast to chat with all of you. Let me turn the sound loose. It's kind of loud. Um, and to talk Star Wars, to see what you think about the recent episodes, about the Book of Boba Fett, the Mandalorian, or whatever we're talking about in the world of Star Wars. And that's the nice thing about this. You know, we get to share our opinions. Like, there are so many people that are hearing your opinions because you join us every Monday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live. 
you really do have a voice. Your voice is being heard around the galaxy and around the podcast airwaves everywhere for joining the show. And I want to thank you so much for doing that each and every week. Again, this week on Coffee with Kenobi, we talked in great detail about this episode, Return of the Mandalorian. Be sure to check it out and let us know what you think. Also, speaking of what you know what, what you think, if you're a member of the CWK Alliance, you get access to our exclusive weekly podcast, CWK Prover. This week we talked about the Moonlight trailer that came out a couple of weeks ago. So be sure to check that out and let us know. The nice thing about Prover is we talk Star Wars, but we talk about all kinds of pop culture. And you can hear that for only 5 bucks a month, which is a pretty good deal. 10 bucks a month for the video podcast itself. Okay, so I guess that's going to do it for this week's show. We will see you all next week and later this week on Coffee with Kenobi. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jason says, have a great week. Uh, Anthony, thanks for a great show, Dan. See you all next week. Sounds good, my friend. Ross, have a great week, friends. May, uh, may one day's magic this week be just as inspiring as Chapter 5. Embrace the process. Exactly. Embrace the process. We're very optimistic. Blake says, love my CWK family. Y'all are the best, and thank you for making this the best Star Wars family online. Yeah, likewise, my friend. Ian says, looking forward to seeing everyone's spoiler-free reactions on Wednesday morning. That's right. We're going to get that scheduled. Mason says, bye, Harry Potter. Liberty says, have a great week, guys. Uh, ben says, great chat tonight about a great episode. Thank you for the fun. Thank you, my friend, for joining us. Alex, good night. Have a great night. Brian, great show, Dan. Thank you. Good luck with Order of the Phoenix. Mason, awesome. Brian, thank you so much. Mason is going to let you all know next week how much he's gotten read. Dan says, thank you, my team. See you out there. We will see you. Brian, Mason says, thank you to you. You guys have a great one. And remember, this is the podcast you're looking for. Have a great one, everybody. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along. Move along.